Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down with City of Winkler, Manitoba, Councillor Mike Grenier. But before we get into the interview with Councillor Grenier, I want to take a moment and ask you to do a favor. Head over to our YouTube channel, if you're listening to this, and hit that subscribe button. It helps us grow our show and continue to bring great interviews like the one you're about to hear today to your ears and your eyes. We also want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you to our new subscribers of the Cross Border Interviews family series of shows. Uh, we want to thank Dwayne from Manitoba. We want to thank Shar from Alberta. And we want to thank Jennifer from Alberta as well. Your contributions mean a lot to us. So thank you so much for continuing to make municipalities matter again. If you want to become one of our backers and subscribers to the show, head over to crossborderinterviews.ca and hit the support us now page. For as little as $3 a month, you can make municipalities matter again. Now on to our interview with Councillor Grenier. Mike, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and chatting about yourself in the city of Winkler. And I want to start with a generic question, but it's an overarching question of what the show is all about. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Mike? Uh, I think it came from growing up, uh, always had this perception that municipal politicians and politicians in general were old retired people who were out of touch. And um, as I crept into my 30s, I thought, well, you know, the as the saying goes, the, you want to be the change that you want to see. And so I thought, oh, let's uh, let's try to make change. And I got there and uh, realized that uh, you know, we're not all old, but we're probably all equally out of touch in different ways. So I just want to make sure that I, I, I did my correct research. But in 2014, sure. you, you first get elected, correct? Right, correct. So is that the first time you put your name on the ballot or is this a, a second attempt? Because uh, uh, Manitoba yeah. seems to be a hard place to find election results municipally. <laughs> but what happened prior to 2014 or uh, transpired in 2014 that said yeah. it's time for Mike to get on the council? Uh, well, yeah, it is uh, difficult to find a whole lot in Manitoba. I think Wikipedia was probably my best source. But uh, I did run in uh, 2010. Uh, that was an unsuccessful campaign regarding an election, but uh, successful, I would say, by every other measuring uh, stick there. We had uh, six incumbents, two very well known and in one case returning counselor who took a hiatus. Um, I think there was two other candidates and then myself kind of uh, younger at that point and unknown. So it was one of those where, um, you know, knowing I was punching outside of my weight class there, I was going to give it a try and hope I didn't embarrass myself. And uh, I was happy enough with the results that uh, I did it again in 2014. So what was the draw to municipal politics for yourself? Because um, it is the closest to the people, but it seems like, and I, I did a bit of research on you, and mm -hmm. it seems like your resume would allow you to potentially run federally or even provincially, but you chose municipally. And what was that about? Um, I mean, like you said, it's definitely being closest to the people. Um, I feel like for myself, I could... I could be the be a part of more change locally um, and just, yeah, being connected. Uh, yeah, just understanding what's happening, everything locally. We're kind of grassroots. Um, and for myself, the nice thing running municipally, uh, I'm running purely on uh, doing what I believe is best for the community. I don't have any party lines to tow it's purely for the the taxpayers of Winkler now you've been on the city of Winkler councillor for nine years now you're actually right. like starting your ninth year as of <laughs> us talking right now starting which is to great. feel like a veteran <laughs> so 
I want to know from your perspective, has the role of a municipal councillor changed in those nine years? Do you see yourself addressing issues that you weren't addressing in your first term as a city councillor? Um, for myself personally, for sure, uh, I've been fortunate all three terms. There's been uh, a wealth of experience around the council table that I could draw from. Uh, it's allowed me to learn and get comfortable so definitely now in term three, there's more, um, I feel like I've got to be more, uh, well, there's more wisdom that comes with the experience. And with that, I think more expectation, uh, at least that I put on myself. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, from a community perspective, uh, we had a meeting last week and it actually and it tied into this a bit where like Winkler's grown, uh, I'll say from about 11,000 to probably near 15,000 people in my nine years on council. And I hear stories about how we used to be very hands-on and like to the point where well before 2014, I'm sure, but where essentially council could tell the greater operator, start on this street and work your way there. Uh, with growth and a pretty amazing team of city employees as well. Uh, the director is the city manager. Uh, we can be a lot more hands off. And um, again, their, their level of expertise and uh, just understanding their role. Uh, I think they make us all look pretty smart most days. <laughs> so you, you just mentioned one of the key things that I like talking about, and that is the weight and responsibility of this role because you impact your residents on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. You're not out of, you're not off in Winnipeg. You're not off in Ottawa where uh, right. decisions can take a few weeks or even months or even years to be affected, but you make a decision at council. It changes the way that people have to adapt the day after. Right. How much weight does that come with the job? How much weight do you put on yourself to make sure you're, you're doing it correctly, that you're impacting people, but in a positive way and making sure that the right. impact helps people and not harms them? Yeah, and uh, it's it's very real. Again, I think municipally, the biggest one always comes down to uh, the property taxes, the mill rate. Uh, and as we you know, are creeping closer to the new year and we start to budget for that, um, it's no secret that cost of living is up everywhere and including city costs, obviously. So how do we balance our rising costs with being responsible and not burdening the taxpayer any more than necessary? Um, and then even out of their um, you, know, you talk about service levels and it would be easy in September, October, say, you know what, let's just cut snow removal service. Let's clear less frequently. December, January is going to roll around and it's going to be, oh, shoot. What kind of decision was that we made then? Um, so, yeah, looking big picture and uh, again, what is the the best outcome for Winkler and its residents and taxpayers, not just today, not just next year, but you know, setting up next terms council, setting up you know, my kids when they grow up and decide to call this home, hopefully. You bring up a good point about the affordability crisis. And I was going to talk about this a little bit later, but we'll talk about it now if that's okay. And sure. I want to know, because you're heading into a budget cycle, which is quite challenging for uh, anyone anyone right yeah. now is challenging but you play an impact on people's day-to-day -day lives so over the last few years i can imagine the budget cycle has been tough with everything going on yeah. in the world but this one is going to be tougher because you now have the realities of the world the realities of growing a city like winkler who has seen ex excess like expansion left right and center with yeah. the realities that if you do it on the back of your residence, that could mean that someone goes without food for a week or goes without food, or, right. uh, like insurance. So how do you see your role in balancing that aspect that you understand that you need to move the city forward, but you can't do it on the backs of the municipality of the residents? Right. And it's cliche, but it's a bit of that tightrope act where... <laughs> 
you know, we're trying to balance and uh, I mean, we had a report just earlier this fall and they were saying that the local food bank is has seen double the users from this time last year. And, you know, Winkler is predominantly working class, a lot of manufacturing. So they're working, but now they're putting in 40, 50 hours a week. And some of them are still having to use a food bank on occasion. Uh, that definitely weighs in, I think, for everybody around that council table when it comes to uh, deciding, you know, how do we move forward with tax rates and things like that. And, and again, the employers themselves, where what's best for them, we don't want to handcuff businesses and the, the drawback of that having layoffs or anything like that happen as a result of decisions. So uh, I think again, the, the information that, our directors uh, provide for us uh, has been instrumental. And again, like I said earlier, they, they do a lot of the heavy lifting and uh, they make us look smart yeah, on a regular basis and keep us from wearing too much egg in public. So, but you, you are the king of setups here because you're, you're basically <laughs> taking away my next question. So I'm glad that this is the great conversation already. <laughs> But you're right. You, you as a councillor are the local representative. You yeah. make decisions, they impact people the next day, good, bad, or ugly. And you know after nine years that you're never going to please 100% of the people. I don't care what you do, you're not going to please 100% of the people. Yeah. How do you balance that aspect of the job? Because I can imagine you want to do best for everyone, but you know that you're going to upset some people and you're going to ruffle yeah. some feathers and you're going to make people who may not like you or lose friends or lose family yeah. members who don't want to talk to you. How mm -hmm. do you balance that aspect? Because you go to the grocery store the day after the council meeting, people are going to stop you and say, why did you make that vote? How do you balance right. the personal life and private life of a counselor? Um, I mean, the first term I, I claimed I just kept my head in the sand. Uh, but no, again, as I talk about with the, the experience, the expectations I have for myself, um, I mean, the, the public aspect, I haven't really, I haven't really shied away from, but at the same time, um, I've been fortunate that I haven't, and I've been in the, the spotlight the way, say, our mayor could be, or, uh, different counselors at different times who have been maybe more visible. Uh, so I've been lucky in that sense that, um, you know, the balance has been. Like, will you get stopped on the street when you're out with your kids? Oh, for sure. Like it's, and even I mean, if I. I'm assuming your kids have just gotten to the point where like, oh, dad's going to talk about politics. I'm walking oh, away it's... for 20 minutes. <laughs> My kids have, uh, they're 12 and, and nine now. And uh, so when I'm not wearing my counselor hat, I'm also a realtor and my wife is a teacher. So they, they know there is no quick trip to the grocery store. There is no, you know, we go to church. We're not just walking out. Somebody's going to talk to somebody and uh, they've, they've developed, uh, I think, just the environment they live in, they've had to get used to that and I think largely I'm always willing to engage and outside of maybe these one-offs it's always been respectful which makes it easy um, you know, and I mean those one-offs they typically aren't going to put their name behind their comments there and you disregard that and so but it brings up a good point. How much respect? Sure. How much does respect come into play? Because you're there to uh, represent everyone, even the people who didn't right. vote for you, and even if the people disagree with the way you vote, you have to respect them enough to give them your time to say, "Okay, you can vent, but do it in a respectful manner." Correct? Yeah, yeah. And for myself, I think that is it's definitely an important component um, where. I'm, I'm respecting their time and engaging in a conversation, say, well, I want to simply go buy myself some bologna and bread. But 
at the same time, if they have concerns or a disagreement, um, that mutual respect that it's going to be a civil discussion. Even if we disagree, we can still and uh, go about our day and there's no ill will. Um, and again, largely we're fortunate. I think that the, the, the large majority of these discussions and interactions are respectful. Are the interactions that you're dealing with more municipal level jurisdictional issues or they talk when people approach you, are they talking about provincial issues, federal issues, or are they Uh, understanding that there is a jurisdictional role and responsibility that municipalities play compared to the provincial or even the uh, federal government? uh, There is a little bit of that. uh, I'll I'll call it an educational component where uh, somebody may say, uh, you know, this highway is in rough shape. Why don't you fix it? Or um, you know, I don't like you know, this in you know, whatever. I don't like that my kid didn't make the volleyball team. Neither of those is my lane as municipal council. One of them's. Please tell me you're joking that that's been approached to you. Please tell Uh, me you're joking that that someone actually complained about their kid not making the volleyball team here. Oh, that one was me grasping at straws. I mean, that was, (laughs) I was like, what else can I use? And yeah. Well, would would people come talk to you about healthcare? Because healthcare is a provincial jurisdiction. Healthcare is a common one. Uh, Healthcare, education, uh, I mean, highways, of course. (laughs) Uh, and, And that's where that education uh, it becomes part of the discussion that would I like this highway cleaned? Would I like shorter wait times in the clinic? Absolutely. But as municipal council, there's only so much and it's a very little scope of influence we have in that regard. And that's usually frustrating to them because uh, a lot of times their view of the influence we have as municipal council, as municipal leaders um, you know, they they may think that I've got a direct line to our new premier, uh, <laughs> and it's just simply not the case. And but you have a direct line to your MLA. I'm assuming after nine years, you know who your MLA is. I'm not sure if uh, the new MLA in your area did get changed over. If there was an incumbent who retired and then right. a new uh, MLA stepped in. But I'm assuming you know your local MLAs compared to John on the street who may not know them like firsthand, like yourself being in the role of right. counselor. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's like both our MLA and our MP are uh, are new within the last few months. So, uh, but yeah. Oh, that's we, right. Okay. Yeah. I forgot I that know. you just went through a by-election federally yeah, as well. Yeah, by-election <laughs> federally as well. So understanding, yeah, so I've got to just, to talk with both of them. Um, Do I have their direct lines? No, but I can probably get somebody who can get in touch with them. And and just, again, part of that education process that, uh, and respecting those channels that even if I had my MLA's private number, I'm not gonna haphazardly start sending them text messages with complaints about a highway. What's the engagement like in Winkler? When you ask people for their opinion, do they give them give you your their opinion, good, bad, or ugly? Or is there uh, just as long as my water's turned on and my garbage is picked up at the end of the day and my pothole in front of my house is fixed whenever there's a pothole, I'm content with municipal government? Uh, I think we have pretty good engagement. Uh, I mean, sometimes we forget that there was a holiday and our garbage day got pushed back a day. Uh, I'm guilty of that myself where... It's like, where'd my garbage man go? I put it out and it's like, oh, forgot. Yesterday was a holiday. So my garbage day is like the day after now. Um, but yeah, I would say the engagement is pretty good. Um, again, grassroots, they there's a comfort that the, the residents and the taxpayers can talk to us because realistically, we, we're just like them. We live in the same town as them. They, they simply voted for us to and uh, be in public office and and steer the ship a bit and uh, but the engagement's been good and uh, and there too like they will they will share their opinion 
uh, good, bad, or ugly. And again, the vast majority are respectful when it is uh, an ugly opinion. Um, the odd one, again, like anywhere else, kind of goes off and and you're looking for the exit, but that's anywhere. You bring up a, an interesting point because you, at the end of the day, have to make the final decision when you're at that council table. Now, I've had the yeah. pleasure to watch a few of your city council chambers, be, uh, council <laughs> meetings, because I'm one of those nerds who actually does that, who actually <laughs> sits there for three hours watching a meeting. And I know your last one, October 10, was only an hour. So I thank you. Thank you so yeah. much for making that meeting easy for yeah. me to watch. But you have to engage with people and get their understanding of what where they want to see things go, whether it be budget, yeah. whether it be this, that, or the other. In those conversations, do you ever find yourself saying, I didn't think about it that way, and I'm glad someone talked to me about this because now I can make a better decision at the council table, whether it be a complete opposite of what I thought I was going to vote for or yeah. maybe a different way that I ask administration for some more information regarding an issue? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, we have those discussions and and there's times that it's, yeah, you get somebody else's view. And like you said, it's like, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that ramification or that impact. And I think that's the nice thing municipally again, is we've got seven different voices, seven different spheres of influence, and it gives us a pretty good balance of you know, I think what the community wants and uh, and again, the information we get is critical to those decisions. I know there's times we talk about, um, like in the past where we've had a fairly, fairly flat increase to the tax rate and based on the information at that time, that was the right decision. And we look at it now with cost of living and realizing that, uh, our operating budget maybe was okay, but our reserves weren't being able to keep up. So then it's like, oh, those decisions were even in retrospect. I think we all sit there at different times and think, wow, wish I knew that yesterday. Um, I want to turn to my second segment because I just realized we're sure. 20 minutes into this and I haven't even got to the <laughs> second segment. And it's the most important segment, in my opinion, yeah. because I like talking about the issues. Um, right. Now, before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. <laughs> this is an opinion of the councillors. Now, councillor, because I want to make sure yes. I do this correctly, <laughs> in your opinion... What yeah. do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Winkler today as of recording this episode? Uh, I think the biggest issues all stem from, from growth, and these are good problems to have. Um, you know, they're largely water, wastewater, public transportation, and all of these items come with a cost to the taxpayer but we need to you know we need these things as part of being a sustainable city we need them as as it pertains to growth and uh, sorry, I'm just drawing a blank there. Uh, no, because I want to, because you talk about infrastructure and I, I'm yeah. assuming when you talk about infrastructure, you're not only talking about the growth of infrastructure, but you're also talking right. about the aging infrastructure because municipalities right. are in this weird zone right now where things are aging out of ability to use them. Yeah. Now, you, you, you're right. You can't do this on the back of the residents. You can't do this on the backs of the taxpayer, but... You, there's no other way because even if the province gives you money, that's from the taxpayer. If the federal right. government gives you money, it's the taxpayer. Tax so how do yeah. you do it in a sustainable way that makes people feel like the city is still growing sustainably, but not doing it on the backs of the residents? Because you there yeah. and as council as a whole have to look at this as a city issue and not as a infrastructure issue. Right. Um. Like I think when it comes to growth, uh, we do our best with the information we have to ensure that growth essentially pays for itself. So if, you have developers we, knocking on your door right now. Like are people wanting uh, we, to build in Winkler? Yeah, like we've got two 
uh, I'd say most of Winkler's development is two residential commercial developers and a host of other smaller, uh, smaller developers, infill developers, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, largely we have two different developers that um, will facilitate the residential development in new areas. So ensuring that we're not you know, necessarily making somebody who's you know, in their 50 year old bungalow have to subsidize a new development. Um, but the flip side of that, ensuring that that 50 year old bungalow is still being assessed and, and taxed accordingly and, and being, yeah, just aware of that. And in, infrastructure overall, we're in a, at the moment, I would say a, a decent position in the sense that probably, and I'm guessing here that about half of our residential infrastructure is in that 30 years or less range. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Like, yeah. So at the moment, that infrastructure still looks okay. But that doesn't mean we can kick that can 30 years down the road and assume that it'll take care of itself then. So we want to make sure our older core infrastructure is, is being upgraded and maintained as needed. And as well that we're planning ahead for that, say, 30 year infrastructure as it reaches life expectancy that we can, say, replace or reline those water lines and whatever else may need to be done. The roads now, and... you, you talked about a lot of growth and growth means the yeah. future, what's going to happen yeah. in the future and you have to prepare for the future. But yeah. you as a council and as a counselor have to look at the here and now as well, the individual yeah. issues, the people who stop you on the street and say, uh, Mike, I need a new playground because mine's dilapidated and it's falling apart. Yeah. Mike, I need a walking trail. I need a new sidewalk in front of my house. I'm assuming you've heard the gambit of issues locally, yeah. individually. How do you balance the needs of the individual? And I'm quoting Star Trek here for anyone who's yeah. listening right now. How do you balance the needs of the many with the, against the needs of the few or against the one? Because every person believes their issue is the most important issue in the mm -hmm. world. And you have to make sure people feel like the, their, the, their taxes are being used accordingly and helping them as well. Yeah. Uh, I think largely when that happens, because everybody wants to feel their opinion is heard and validated and, and, and they are uh, quite often. I, I will acknowledge that I can't flip a switch and make these decisions. There's, there's a process. And uh, when it comes to, to politics, it's not like business where you can make that decision quickly. Uh, <laughs> it all gets drawn out. So I will typically take that complaint or question or concern, um, you know, bring it to the appropriate director, uh, bring it up at a council meeting. We have those discussions there, um, you know, and then and again with seven different spheres of influence there, uh, we tend to get, I think, a pretty good cover of, like if somebody say at the south end of Winkler says they need a new sidewalk and, somebody say downtown says we need new sidewalks around the school because they're crumbling uh, both are valid concerns but how do we prioritize that and and in a situation like that obviously if the school is legitimately dealing with crumbling sidewalks that's probably going to take priority you know you don't have an unlimited supply of money though because you, yeah. you are in the re you you live in the here and now and the reality yeah. of municipal government is they don't have unlimited and you have to balance your budget each year you can't run deficits yeah. right. um so i can imagine the word no has been spoken a lot over the last nine years when people say i need this and you have to say unfortunately we can't do that now right. so no we may be able to do it 10 years from now, maybe three years from now, but right here, right now, unfortunately, no. How hard yeah. is it to say no to residents, especially when you're dealing with 
local people who you know, who are your friends, who are your uh, co-workers, who people yeah. you meet on the street? It's, it is tough. Um, especially like I'll, I'll pick on the current season. We've just started hockey. Do it, do it. <laughs> and, and everybody, when's the new, when's the renovation happening at the Centennial Arena? I don't know. I, I'm a rink rat. I, that's my happy place. I could probably live in an arena and not complain. But so I would love to see it as much as anyone else, but it's like, I, I can't, I can't give a concrete answer on that. I'd be speculating. <laughs> So those are, I mean, that's an easy one because that one, it pains me personally because I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it yesterday, but um, not being able to give a concrete answer on that uh, and even things more important than, you know, recreation facilities. Um, yeah, it is, it is tough to say no. Um, yeah, nobody likes hearing no, nobody likes being the bearer of bad news, but so that's it's kind of the hat you have to wear sometimes so i have been accused on this show of in this segment talking about only the negative things so i have tried <laughs> to make a change and say what are the accomplishments of winkler over the last nine years that you say and you can point to and say you know what my legacy if i decide to leave tomorrow mm -hmm. will be x mm -hmm. my legacy of how i've left uh, made an impact on mm -hmm. the city of winkler is why what are the accomplishments that you can point to over the last nine years that you can say i'm doing it for the right reasons uh i think over the last nine years like the the big one is definitely the meridian exhibition center uh so getting the second ice rink and the field uh, field house turf facility adjoined to it uh is definitely nice to have the the cross use of groups that use that is is pretty incredible from trade shows to soccer to ice sports to you know yeah so many other groups that get to use the facility that's a big one um i mean just even seeing the growth i think for myself one of the big ones when i started i was part of uh, a chairperson of uh our local affordable housing initiative um so that was it was really cool to see a local initiative helping those that are are struggling with housing uh that since taken off and uh they've you know they've got including the the manitoba housing units oh i don't even remember the number there but yeah they've done a phenomenal job growing that program. Um, I'd say more recently, the one that I kind of, you know, the feather in my cap is regional connections, again, with the growth and uh, the the immigration. It's, I mean, Winkler is still by and large, uh, you know, very Mennonite uh, dominant culture, but seeing, oh, it's well over 40 different nationalities. And like, we have, I think in the last year, the, the largest immigration groups were Philippines, um, oh, um, Philippines, India, Nigeria. So the number of folks that want to come here and settle in Winkler and the number of them that stay in Winkler, not just settle and then move on. Uh, it's been really cool to see that and be a part of that as well. Um, I want to turn to my last subject because I am cautious sure. of time and we're almost at the 40 minute mark here. I okay. want to talk about my favorite subject and that is tourism. Yeah. I like tourism. I like visiting communities. I think Canadians need to spend more economic dollars visiting their own backyards instead of spending it in sunny Cancun. Not saying Cancun's uh, not bad, but I'm just saying maybe go spend a, a day or two in Winkler, Manitoba. So for those who are listening and for someone who will be visiting Winkler because you've come on the show and I will make sure that I make a pit stop and spend a few days in Winkler, what should people do? What are the hidden gems of Winkler that need to be discussed more openly. Now, first off, when you come through, make sure you let me know and we can uh, grab a coffee or a lunch or whatever's going to work out that day. It's a political uh, municipal date. <laughs> perfect. Love it. Uh, but what things to do in Winkler, like we've got 
Uh, I mean, the parks, we've got our Bethel Heritage Park. Uh, you walk through there and it really gives you Winkler's history in a nutshell. You've got the the initial monument for the Jewish settlers, the uh, conscientious objectors monument regarding um, Mennonites that chose not to participate actively in World War II, uh, and another monument for those that chose to actively participate in, in the war. Uh, just acknowledging these different aspects of our past uh, and there's, yeah, it's, it's our old hospital site actually, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's a neat little park. You've got, uh, a water fountain, if I recall correct, is a replica of New York Central Park. I hope I got that right. Otherwise I'm going to hear about it. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, we've got that. We've got a, a nature sanctuary at the Northeast corner of town where we've got, you know, native tall grass. You've got birds and ducks and all sorts of wildlife living in their natural habitat there and there's a walking trail through there um, and we've got the um, actually a real cool uh, corporate and I guess city initiative we have a really neat uh, Canadian Tire accessibility playground right at our main park there on Park Street in Winkler uh wonderful for like accessibility for everyone um you know, so we've got that uh the pool the campground um yeah our where, where do you facility. go i, I know you I said go? you're i know you said you're a rink rat but come on where else do you go in town to just let it all decompress because i can imagine nine years the job has yeah. not gotten easier it's probably gotten yeah. more stressful and even uh, with your day job as a realtor i can imagine yeah. there's days you just want to decompress and let it all go where do you go yeah. in town or the city? Uh, most nights i end up going wherever my kids activities lead <laughs> so <laughs> the rink the rink the ball diamond uh, things like that but no um outside of that we've got some really i would say under recognized walking and bike trails through and around town uh, i'm not a walker but i do like getting on my bike and put on whatever say 10 kilometers and just blow off some steam and listen to a wonderful political podcast while i do it and i wonder who's <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, Whatever so, catches my ear that day. <laughs> um, so I want to end on the million dollar question. I think sure. at the end of the day, every municipal politician should be able to answer this question. I think they know how to, but I think we need to put it on the record. So in your opinion, why do you believe Winkler is such a great place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Uh it is everyone will judge you if with this answer in Winkler now, Mike. Come <laughs> oh, on, you gotta oh, knock out of the, me, park. <laughs> the, the The friends and family whose voices are in my head at this moment is unreal. <laughs> um, no, it is, uh, I mean, affordability, safety. I mean, uh, I can be honest and say I still leave my vehicle unlocked at night. I'm not worried about somebody stealing my tic tacs and my quarters. Um, it's, we have, yeah, we have, uh, a safe community. We've got you know, the affordability, like the, the employment options, uh, are, are just about endless. It feels like, and I mean, all of that's great, but I think it comes down to really just the community that, um, we have these groups that they, they want to live in Winkler. They choose to call Winkler home. Uh, I mean, you can find a job anywhere. You can you know, find schools anywhere, but where you feel welcome, where you can talk to your neighbor. And I think that's a big part of, of what still makes Winkler great is, you, you know, your neighbors, I mean, they can go on a holiday and you know, your house is taken care of. Oh, you, know, you, you can still go there and ask for a pound of butter if you're short really yeah it's that close-knit it is yeah there's still that sense of you know i 
community so that yeah that sense of community meeting uh, again my kids I mean, it, it's not a long trek but i still have zero concern when i send them to school in the morning unsupervised on their bicycles because i know that they're going to be taken care of i'm not worried about um, not that we're immune to it but i'm not dwelling on things that could happen it's you're not dwelling on the things people. around the corner right yeah i'm not worried about them driving through a bad neighborhood or or anything like that or a high traffic you know intersection necessarily and there's places they know you know yeah that community i'm assuming it's one of those communities that you still see the bikes on the front yard because you know where all the kids are because they're all the bikes are on the front yard right Oh yeah, you still see it. Uh, I mean, you, yeah, you go to uh, the the skate park, or yeah, especially summertime, you, you drive around Winkler and you know where all the kids are because, like you said, there's you know eight bikes laying in the yard, and I mean, maybe they're not playing the classic Nintendo anymore, but they're they're playing whatever version the kids are playing this day. Um. Mike, I want to thank you. Yeah. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down, taking 40 minutes out of your day and doing this interview. Um, I think municipal politicians don't get the recognition that they so sorely deserve. And I think that uh, I'm hoping that I'm uh, ex expanding people's minds to actually think that municipal politics is important and it is the most important level of government that in impacts people. So thank you for serving your community. Thank you for being part of your community. And thank you for making your community a better place for people across Winkler and even across uh, Southern Manitoba. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for for mentioning that and uh, I mean for the invitation uh, to be on the yeah your podcast here this is uh, I mean, this was definitely something I had circled on my calendar and uh, I was looking forward to it I've enjoyed listening to it and to now participate was was kind of that that ray of sunshine today for sure Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, when I'm in uh, Winkler, I will certainly look you up, but hopefully we can connect before then in Brandon uh, when I'm coming through for the AMM conference in uh, oh. hopefully either next month or in the spring of next year. Yes, I am intending to be there at the end of November. So if you are there, uh, let's grab I a coffee. Hope, absolutely. That would be great. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross-Border Interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Till next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.